A quick content warning for today's video as we will be discussing suicide, sexual assault, rape, drug use and abuse, and school shootings. Any on-screen depictions of any of the above will be extremely mild and if you do need to step away at any time, feel free to do so. This video will still be here for you to come back to later. Yeah, it took me a really long time to make part 2 and I am sorry about that. However, those of you who have been watching my videos on Telltale's The Walking Dead will know that series is belovedly annual, so this is pretty good for me all things considered. But yeah, the reason why it took me so long to make this video is because season 2 of 13 Reasons Why is, as I discovered, actually pretty boring, especially in the first half. It's tremendously boring and actually kind of insulting, but we'll cover that later on. Now, I thought season one had pacing problems, but that season is an efficiently written spark note compared to this marathon of endurance. Somehow, whilst watching season two, I would get eight hours in and still be on the fourth episode. It was very bleak, so in the end I got some friends to help me out. This obviously meant that I had to stream them all season one to get them up to speed, and while a fairly inefficient use of my time, it did show me something. My friends did enjoy the show and found so certain scenes impactful, but I still watched them rip 13 Reasons Why to pieces, occasionally in ways that I consider to be really unfair. Which I hope you understand does say something coming from me, considering I had a lot of critiques to make about season 1 in my last video. And while I was content to let them view it however they needed to, I sometimes found myself also fumbling in some defences of the show here and there. I would be like, Hannah's actually really relatable when you've been in her situation. I'd insist, yeah I know it's just a list, but when you think about it, it establishes a reputation that isolates her from her peers. I kept awkwardly interjecting to tell them that they were wrong and I would get called a nerd. With love, of course, but a nerd all the same. Still, while I stamped my size 6 shoes and insisted on them taking Hannah's plight seriously, it did make me realise that this is clearly a series that I do enjoy. It's a series that speaks to me and, as I saw from the comments on my previous video, spoke to loads of you as well. However, despite my strong feelings, most notably shown in me piping up in a voice chat full of men to defend the show and explain to them exactly how the portrayals of bullying are actually bang on target, I can also acknowledge the glaring flaws in the show too. In fact, it reassured me. While I may not be the fittest person to critique every scrap of 13 Reasons Why, I feel like I like it and respect it enough to do it justice. Whilst also being fairly critical in ways that aren't just saying Hannah is making a big deal out of nothing or isn't a realistic teenager because I think she is a really realistic teenager. Hannah's behaviour spoke to me a lot. While I couldn't empathise with everything she did, I at least understood the journey that she was on. Or I did, because then season 2 happened, and oh my god. Now, real quick, if you've not seen part 1 of the video series, I'd recommend you go check it out. I'll put a link in the video description, and these videos will also be part of a playlist, whatever works, but basically I won't be rediscussing the issues that I've discussed in previous parts, so if you would like to be caught up to speed, that's going to be your best option. But before we dive into analysing the points of season 2, I'd like to take this opportunity to address some of the comments from the previous video, so if you aren't interested in hearing that, I will put this video into chapters to make it easier for you to hear the bits that you're really interested in. Then we'll conclude and I will hastily pitch my Patreon and other social links to you. Okay, let's get going. A little note before we start, first of all I just wanted to thank everyone who tucked into the comments section for the last video. Sometimes I have controversial ideas and opinions and sometimes I don't, and I was glad to see that people found my arguments reasonable whilst also presenting reasonable discussions of their own. It was a very civilised comment section. Some of the stories you shared were super heartbreaking, some of them were super sweet, but all of them were interesting. Now I don't get a chance to respond to every single comment, but I am honestly really Really grateful to everyone who shared their experiences. Thanks for sharing your stories and your thoughts, your ideas for how the show could have be, like been improved, and overall just thanks for turning the comment section into a hive of support and construction. Now just to address a super frequent criticism of my video that kept cropping up in the comment section was people saying like, Kirsty, this is based on a book, this isn't an original show. Which many of you are probably wrinkling your brows at already. Some of those comments were even suggesting outright that I had concealed the fact that it was originally a book on purpose, like this was some kind of illicit intentional character assassination of an Netflix TV show, done with the intention of pretending that it was an original piece of work. Honestly, even as I say it out loud, I can't quite follow the logic of these comments, but I think it would be efficient to just address the comments here and now and just 
get it out there. Yes, I didn't mention that the TV series was based on a book. No, it was not some kind of intentional subterfuge. And I originally had planned that video to feature a huge passage where I compared the TV series and the book, discussed the changes in context and whether or not they were made for the better or worse, but two reasons why I didn't. One, it meant that my video ended up having two very different arguments running throughout. The first was the argument that I kept, which was that the show was inherently harmful and had an actual kill count. And the second, which was the argument that I removed, was that the show stepped away from the book often for the sake of shock factor and ended up harming the message even more. While it was definitely an interesting pair of perspectives to view the TV series through, that script ended up being way too long and way too difficult to keep wrapped up together. I couldn't keep the arguments consistent without straying too far away, I was going on massive tangents, and in the end I had cut the book discussion entirely to save space and just forgot to sub in a paragraph where I explained why I wasn't going to discuss the book. I just assumed that it didn't matter and and it would just be implicitly understood by the comment section. Uh, and I was wrong, I'm sorry. B, and my second reason, was, and I know that this goes without saying for a lot of you, many of you already understand this, but this being a TV series based on a book doesn't remove the TV series from criticism, especially since it took creative liberty with the original story. I originally wrote a big paragraph in this script for this video explaining why a TV show can be criticised even if it's based on something else, but honestly at this point those who get it get it and those who don't don't and they won't benefit from having it explained here by me. With all that out of the way, let's crack on with season 2. As with season 1, the second season of 13 Reasons Why begins every single episode with a short word from the actors out of character to explain to us, quote unquote, 13 Reasons Why is a fictional series that tackles real world issues, taking a look at sexual assault, substance abuse, suicide and more. By shedding a light on difficult topics, we hope our show could help viewers start a conversation. They pitched the tragic 13reasonswhy.info website we took a look at in the last part of this video series, they then remind us that this series might not be right for us if we're actually dealing with any of the depicted issues, and then they send us on our way. Now, many shows contain difficult scenes, that's normal, but 13 Reasons Why specifically positions itself as a show that intends to start a conversation, or more implicitly, it introduces itself to us as an educational tool as well as entertainment, and reminds us of this fact at the beginning of every single episode of every single series. Between all of the teenage angst and drama and all of the shedding light on real world topics, this show can't decide whether it wants to be a PSA or fucking Iconio. The use of the phrase shedding a light tells us that we are about to be shown issues that don't see a lot of light, aren't discussed very much, or in the ways that are important, and that the show will be delivering the honest, ugly, non-sensationalised truth, because we can't have a conversation if we're not depicting it correctly. And since the show makes that claim, it means that we can judge it on its success. So the plan for us as we look into season two, we will discuss each of the major storylines from roughly best to worst. They're not strictly ranked, but just more vaguely good through to vaguely bad, so let's try and give this show the benefit of the doubt before we start unpacking the dregs. Let's go. Now, let's set the scene real quick. At the end of last season, we saw Tony hand the tapes over to Hannah's parents as the court case began. All of the tapes had been listened to by everyone except Bryce. Clay had his mandated meltdown and Alex attempted to take his own life. Season 2 starts with Clay, who is still sad, but he's now dating Skye. Alex has amnesia and significant physical disability due to the trauma to his brain. The court case is beginning. The tapes are suddenly not being allowed to be admitted as evidence into the court case because somehow that would make things too easy. And perhaps the hardest pill to swallow, Mrs. Baker has a new lid. Mr. Porter's storyline is the strongest of this season, hands down. Mainly because it feels so organic and feeds over so effortlessly from his initial characterisation in season 1 that you can only root for him even more. As we'll discuss, this season features a lot of retcons. Like, a lot of retcons. In the epitome of plot contrivance, some of the characters we previously discussed are about to become entirely different people. Sometimes this is for the best, sometimes this is for the worst, either as characters or within the writing itself. Some of them change as characters because more evidence of the relationship they had with Hannah comes to light, and some of them change because it would serve the plot better if they were entirely different people, so instead of writing new characters in, they just make existing characters do enormous 180s, and it gets a little bit exhausting. But luckily, Mr. Porter's growth actually felt super consistent and didn't feel like a retcon. 
At the end of the last series, we saw Mr. Porter stubbornly being presented with the truth that he was one of Hannah's final straws, which I've said my piece on, but whatever. And when we return, he is a changed man. He has had a wake-up call. In the time between seasons, we see that Mr. Porter has come clean to his wife about everything and begun to change his attitude towards his past actions. This guy is in repent mode, and I like it. I guess when you're faced with a truth like the one he's had to face, you can either go one of two ways, full denial or full acceptance. To my surprise, Mr. Porter went the way of acceptance and began to work to atone for his behaviour. I really didn't expect that, but by the same merit it made a lot of sense to me. However, the school isn't even slightly on his side, so Mr. Porter's efforts become borderline vigilante, some rogue adult running around and trying to put things right. Throughout the series he crosses a couple of lines, like yeah he pins Bryce to the wall and threatens him, but I mean Bryce is a rapist, what's he gonna do? Ask him to stop? During a few episodes he shows up to various parents' houses to speak to them in person, which let's face it isn't stellar behaviour, but also doesn't exactly constitute harassment yet anyway. He doesn't visit any parents more than once and although he does get into a fight with Justin's mum's horrible boyfriend, the boyfriend also hits him first so it's hardly Kev's fault. He's extremely supportive of Jessica Davis after all the rape and chases up on instances of bullying she endures upon her return to school. Mr Porter's arc culminates in episode 9 with him sobbing his eyes out on the stand, speaking from the soul. Derek Luke's acting in this scene is so fucking raw. This isn't some sombre masculine single tier protagonist character. This is a man who is breaking at the seams with the guilt he feels over someone's death and I loved him for that. One of the boys I was watching this with blurted out PUSSY and man did I rain hell on him in that moment. Bitch you are part of the problem. Anyway Kev loses his job because he is willing to blame the school, an act the school never sees any consequence for, depicting an honest reality where the good guys don't always necessarily win but they become better people along the way. Kev hands the principal a stack of files of the kids he believes to be the most most at risk, who need weekly if not daily attention, and the principal promptly drops them in the bin in a manner that is woefully villain of the week. Or at least the wiki page I read when I was refreshing myself said that he does, but I swear in the scene he just puts them on the desk, so I have no idea if they swapped the scene, uh, maybe later, or if the writer of the wiki just saw something I didn't but couldn't quite reconcile this contradiction. I didn't know if either side of this coin was canon, so I just thought I'd mention the wiki page and the episode as it happens. Overall, I adored Mr. Porter's arc in this series. He is season two's moral compass, keeping us on track morally, despite the chaos happening around us. He constantly reminds us, the audience, of what the purpose of this whole ordeal is actually supposed to be, in a way that is organic and raw and relatable. A lot of his story is spent combating the willful delusion of the people around him, which is juxtaposed to the willful delusion he was living in in season one, so you know he's learned a lesson. He's also surrounded by people who try to reassure him that what happened wasn't his fault, not the school's fault, not anyone's fault, she did it to herself, and he's like, no, you know, she obviously made the final decision, but I definitely had a part to play in it, and even in the moment I could kind of see what was happening and I chose not to do enough. Mr. Porter's arc is all about personal responsibility with forward momentum. He carries a lot of self-hatred for what he's done, which I think is natural and unavoidable, but instead of hiding from it or using it to feel resentment or bitterness, he uses it to fuel positive change. You know, you can't control the emotions you feel, you can just use them to whichever ends you think of valuable. We watch an adult who has, in his own eyes, sincerely let somebody down and now he needs to set things right and it makes sense and it's not contrived, you know? Mwah! Excellent story arc. We left Alex in season 1 in a pretty bad shape. He's whisked to the hospital with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head, a fake out we are teased to believe might have been Clay, but luckily it's not fatal. Alex is resuscitated and after a coma and a steady recovery, he's back on his feet, albeit shaky. It's been a while, as indicated by the way his bleached hair has entirely grown out, he can't remember anything from the months preceding his suicide attempt, and also he needs to walk with a cane because his motor skills are so limited. Alex's own story is pretty straightforward and seems a natural progression from his previous season self. Serving as the voice of reason for a lot of characters, Alex's observations tend to be very grounded and he frequently makes the morally correct choice when faced with a situation, so as the audience we root for him. Unfortunately however, while Mr Porter finds his feet in this season, Alex drags his. Unlike Mr Porter's development, which was a welcome surprise that formed a good chunk of the emotional core of the show and helped to push events forward, Alex's interactions are more personal and he ends up having very little of an impact on the events 
residents around him beyond attending them, just so that he can make reasonable comments and advise where appropriate. While in season one, Alex was a self-aware teenager who reflected very honestly on his actions, in season two he is so present at everything to voice things so calmly and honestly that he feels like not just an audience stand-in, but potentially even just the writer's stand-in. Alex has this serene self-awareness that only a narrator can possess, and he uses this to just inject judgments that we as an audience are already well aware of. He's like Mr. Porter as a moral compass, except far more explicit in a way that's a little bit ham-handed. Most of Alex's scenes are all about dealing with his newfound disability, overcoming his suicide attempt, picking and choosing which aspects of his previous self he wants to carry forward, and which aspects he wants to leave behind. Alex has some sweet scenes under those circumstances, especially in the first three episodes of the season where he rekindles his relationship with Jessica, but they peter out pretty hard after the halfway point when the action is beginning to ramp up and the story no longer has the time or pacing available to dedicate to Alex's journey. There's even an extremely weird scene where the students confront Monty de la Cruz, the man who, spoilers, has been trying to antagonise everybody from testifying in court by leaving them things on their doorstep or writing notes to them, and in this bizarre decision making, they drive out into the desert alone, Alex walks out of like a black jeep with a cane in one hand that he uses to walk and a gun in the other, and stands there and like threatens Monty and he's like gimme this, gimme that, and I don't really know what the thought process was with this scene, if you've seen it maybe you understand what I mean, it was, it was really weird. Firstly, with the characters, Alex obviously has sustained a massive head injury, he's pretty disabled, he, his reflexes are pretty much zero, his movement is really limited, and he drives out alone by himself to threaten Monty with a gun, with no help, no backup, and he doesn't send like big man Zack Dempsey instead. And he, and Monty knows Alex isn't going to shoot him, so this plan fails. This whole scene was wild. Me and the group chat were watching, we were just entirely confused. It was like one of the writers wanted to make some kind of standoff scene and couldn't figure out a way to put it in, so they just like, yeah, this will do. This will be fine. And speaking of writing, secondly, the writing there's no tension whatsoever in this scene because we are well aware that Alex isn't going to murder his classmate. I feel like they shot the scene and then just didn't want to get rid of it, didn't know what to do with it, so they just left it in, but it is so out of left field and not to be rude, but it was it was silly, you know, it was silly. Alex does have some scenes with Zach Dempsey who gets him in the pool to help rehabilitate him and grants him his very first return boner after a little wrestle in the locker room. Much of Alex's arc is about the fact that he can't get hard anymore after his head injury, which makes for some awkward scenes when he underage pays a cam girl for like cam sex and when she finds out that he is underage she boots him you know good for her there's a lot of tv time dedicated to alex's inability to get hard uh, which i assumed might feed into some like masculine instability or insecurity and come back to us later in the season somehow like chekhov's erection but beyond being used later to imply that he might be queer since his first erection back is with zach dempsey and to be honest like who can blame him these scenes where he's trying to get a rock on don't contribute to much beyond like this very tangential or random exploration of what it's like to try and achieve erection after an accident that affects motor ability. So it's up to you what you want to take from this. Like for personally for me, I wouldn't have minded if these scenes weren't in the show. I don't think I would have lost or gained anything even specifically about Alex's character, but they also don't really apply to me in a way that I can relate to. So I, I forego judgment on this. Like if they worked for you, they worked for you. He has a few scenes with Jessica Davis where the two bond over their trauma, but that plotline is abandoned once they kiss and Alex feels nothing, and he has some scenes where he blows up at his parents for coddling him during his recovery and refusing to let him read the note he left. Alex also listens to the tapes again and not a lot comes of that. He provides a lot of ineffectual introspection. Even his time in the courtroom giving his testimony is unmemorable and glanced over. Alex's only real contribution to the overall plot comes towards the end of the season when he is playing a video game that, again, looks like a load of shit. What is it with you, Alex. At first, I think it's another Alex Standall fake out, this time implying that this is making him want to shoot up the school when we see weird flashes while he plays his shooty gun game, and that's not me making random assumptions out of nowhere. We will cover the school shooting plotline later, but not here. Instead, he flashes back to the night of Hannah.
Hannah's rape by Bryce, remembering that he had been playing that same game in Bryce's pool house. Alex recounts that he had heard Bryce having sex in the tub, not realising that he was raping Hannah, and had stuck with the game instead while Monty De La Cruz, a man we will talk about later, goes and marvels at the rape from the pool house window, choosing not to intervene either. From this, we learn that Alex tried to take his own life because he couldn't handle the guilt of having overheard Hannah's rape and not having done anything about it, rather than what was implied by season 1, him feeling guilty over having a part to play in Hannah's isolation from her peers and the resulting bullying, and coming to terms with the fact that his desperation to be liked by Bryce, a man he now hates, meant he shoved his old friend under the bus. I don't necessarily mind this retcon or reveal, is it a retcon? It's not a change more so than the series of events in the first season simply could have had a little omission. I don't mind this development then, let's say. That's a little bit easier to pass. I don't especially mind that Alex's story has been tweaked in its retelling. I think under the right conditions and festering in the mind of the right person, either of those reasons, none, both, neither, are perfectly valid. We find Justin on the streets at the start of season 2. Since leaving home in season 1 due to the abuse of Meth Seth, his mum's live-in boyfriend, Justin is homeless. He's also addicted to heroin now, a factor which contributed to his homelessness since it caused him to burn through his money fairly quickly. As Ryan Shaver reveals during his brief moments on the show, Hannah was far more into Justin than season 1 implied, going as far as to write a bunch of poems about him. She refers to him as forbidden fruit, even after he betrayed her by allowing Bryce to mass text an upskirt shot of Hannah to the school, beginning the downward spiral of her reputation and catalyzing her bullying. Obviously, looking back on season 1, we see that these two hated each other so much that they actively avoided one another, and when Hannah dies, we see a Justin who really simply doesn't care, but whatever, it's different now. They actually stayed in touch, were super close friends, and texted all the time, sure. In the present, Justin's story is three-pronged, coping with his unrequited feelings for Jessica Davis, wanting to testify at the trial, and needing to overcome his drug addiction. I quite liked Justin's characterisation in this season. I'd also recently seen his actor Brandon Flynn in the 2022 Hellraiser movie and he was amazing there as well. Justin masters the puppy dog eyes in season 2 of 13 Reasons Why and wears them proudly for most of his time on set. His repentance for being complicit in Jessica's rape and his subsequent homelessness has left him in a sensitive position. He opens up to people, builds new friendships and even ends up getting adopted by Clay's family. In fact, he becomes the main appeal of Clay's scenes being that Clay has little to do but act unwise this season. Like Mr. Porter, Justin walks into this season wanting to do the right thing. In fact, Justin ends up being so honest about Bryce's rape of Jessica that he receives a month in juvie and six months probation just for being stood outside the door when it happened, in comparison to Bryce's zero juvie and three months probation for being the actual rapist with a rich dad. Beyond that, we have his drug addiction storyline. Now, I've never been addicted to heroin, touch wood, and I also think it's pertinent to remember that a lot of the target audience likely won't ever have encountered heroin in their lives either, although they may eventually encounter a loved one struggling with addiction. Along that vein, if you'll pardon the pun, I think since 13 Reasons Why is presenting itself as an educational tool, it probably could have done a little bit better in highlighting the slow back and forth of progression that addicts experience through Justin's story. Like obviously we get the injection scenes, we get a lot of the recovery scenes, lots of scenes demonstrating Justin's withdrawal symptoms, Clay getting mad when Justin relapses, but I think there's plenty of light shed on stuff like that. Like, like, almost every soap opera has that kind of crap in it. I found all too often that Justin was relapsing almost randomly after minor inconveniences, and while I know that can and does happen, often it will just be the straw that breaks the camel's back, the show isn't really demonstrating the cause and effect in a way that, as a non-addict, inspired empathy. To us, like from what the audience can see, Justin just walks into a location, something stresses him out, he walks straight to his dealer, and then ten minutes later he's got a needle in him. Like, as a human being, I understand that progress isn't linear. You know, it, it can be something super simple, super innocent, like learning languages, or losing weight, or something heavier, like overcoming trauma. It can be three steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it can be one step forward and three steps back. And failing can make you feel worse, sink lower, but that is really the extent of where I can put my empathy. I've not lived Justin's experience whatsoever, and I don't fully understand it. A viewer who is, say, very young, and may not have the experiences to draw on or squeeze out even a, a shred of empathy with, aren't going to look at Justin and think, 
Wow, he's made so much progress. He's been clean for a few weeks and he's been trying, but this domino effect of a day has hit him so hard that he has relapsed. And it's not the end of the world, you know? He can come back from it with effort and work and motivation. Progress isn't always a straight line and sometimes we struggle and sometimes we fall backwards. With love and compassion and effort, he can try again. No, a young viewer is probably not gonna say that. A young viewer is probably going to call him an idiot for falling back on drugs at such an important time. They're going to assume he's letting people down, being selfish, putting drugs over his friends. Yeah, Clay doesn't have to get on one knee and be like, why do we fall, Master Wayne? But I feel like 13 Reasons Why puts a lot of emphasis on the stuff that we as an audience already know happens when it comes to drug addiction. You know, the stuff that makes for drama or frames a scene in a way that's funny or forces two characters to sit down and talk to each other for a bit, like when Tony babysits Justin during his withdrawals. So yeah, Justin has quite a few scenes where he like randomly vomits on somebody's shoes with perfect comedic timing and they just stare at each other awkwardly. But I felt like Justin and his whole process were done pretty dirty in this season. You know, if there really is an intent to teach and shed light, there should have been more of an effort to cultivate empathy with a journey of overcoming addiction. And that doesn't mean we need some kind of Sesame Street on-screen description. I just think that less emphasis on the funny withdrawals and more emphasis on the actual mental process that Justin is going through would have been a lot more useful and a lot more effective here because this show just kind of demonizes drug addiction in a way that many other shows do. And tangentially, Clay has a new girlfriend at the start of this season, Sky. you'll remember her from season one if you've watched that, if you've seen my video on that. She does have a similar addiction arc to Justin, but as with a lot of Clay's storylines and a lot of Clay's baggage, her addiction is more demonstrated to us through how she affects him and his own inner turmoil. And honestly, until I was writing this section of the script, I forgot that her whole addiction arc happened. And till now. Skye's addiction arc is more in the story to serve the purpose of allowing Clay to wrestle between his feelings for Hannah, who is dead, and his living girlfriend Skye, who super duper loves him. It gives him justification to basically see his relationship to Hannah through Skye, go through a bunch of like mental turmoil there, and then once he's kind of through that storyline he can just bin her off and focus on other things while she goes to rehab and is absent for the rest of the season. You know earlier when I mentioned some characters get reworked for season 2? Yeah, Zack is the most egregious example of this. Like, really egregious. Like, they may as well have just invented a new character to broadcast to us all the stuff that they now wedge into Zack's timeline in this season. And then obviously he develops in the present on top of that, so there's quite a bit to discuss about him, and I don't even know where to begin. So while I won't entirely recap what Zack's role was in the initial season, I can say that it appeared like he had only three individual interactions with Hannah, consoling her after a horrible date with Marcus, getting rejected by Hannah at the school cafeteria, and getting confronted by Hannah after stealing from her. However, in season two, Zack reveals that he and Hannah had a relationship, like a proper sexual relationship with clear but unclaimed romantic intentions. There's even a whole summer of intimacy that is entirely omitted from season one because it clearly didn't exist until they were writing season 2. During this time on the stand, Zack reveals that he and Hannah had spent a lot of time together during the summer before her death. Clay was at summer camp, by the way, during this time, which is why he wasn't aware during the previous season, if you were wondering. After receiving the written note from Hannah in their communications class, Zack goes to the cinema where she works over and over again just for an excuse to talk to her. One day, after eating his pack of cigarettes, Zack invites Hannah back to her house to watch a movie, after which point they exchange quote-unquote hundreds of texts. The two of them had a clear romantic connection, and after a particularly forward request by Hannah, I want to lose my virginity and I want it to be great. Would you be interested in having sex? they begin a sexual relationship. They pop each other's cherry and then continue to see each other sexually for a while. They clearly have romantic feelings for each other, but their escapades are foiled when Zack realizes that he is too ashamed of being seen with Hannah to date her publicly. Their relationship ends abruptly at this point and is entirely forgotten about by the story and Hannah too, apparently, since this didn't make it onto the tapes and she and Zack never discuss it again despite their obvious lingering feelings and Hannah's craving for closeness with anyone available. As you can imagine, Clay is really 
really upset about this. In the present, Clay begins to find Polaroids in his locker, depicting Bryce in incriminating positions at a location called the Clubhouse, a location the baseball team attends after practice, because for some reason they all stopped playing basketball as an entire student population, and apparently to spend all their time raping drunk women and taking lots and lots of pictures of it, which are kept in a shoebox. The harbinger of these Polaroids is teased to be many different people, most specifically one completely random guy called Scott Reed, who is introduced and developed entirely for the purpose of being a red herring in this hunt for the Polaroid provider, but, and you've likely already guessed it, it's Zack. When Clay asks why Zack didn't give them the box of Polaroids in person himself, he remarks, because I'm a coward, and then just kind of leaves it there. Zack being the person to give Clay the Polaroids, knowing how much Clay cares, makes sense to me. I didn't find it especially weird, just everything else was weird, you know? I feel like Jessica Davis's journey is one of the strongest backbones of the series. After taking a few weeks of absence to recover, she walks back into school where her rapist, Bryce, has had a captive audience to tell his side of events to, and only his side of events, and obviously he's a big fat liar. Bryce has been spinning a story of consensual sex with Jess, as in she actively cheated on her boyfriend with him, and then regretted it, and then pivoted to a story of rape. And since it's Bryce's word against hers, and he's got a good social standing, a rich dad, and a few weeks head start in telling his own story to a student body who clearly soaked it up, Jess arrives on the back foot. Jessica Davis makes a shaky return to the school year after taking time to recover from her rape. She dresses down for the entire season, her hair is often left down, she, beyond wearing the basic makeup I imagine is required to be stood under TV cameras, isn't made up beyond the bare minimum. Her general demeanour is one of exhaustion, like she's barely rolling out of bed every morning, and Alicia Bow does a great job of portraying someone who is holding it together out of pure spite, refusing to sit this one out for even a minute. Her ostracization begins pretty quickly, which is demonstrated to us by some weird display, some random person sticks up on the wall, it's photos of Jessica dancing at the school prom with the words, who would trust a drunk slut, written on them in paint. And the photos they've used aren't exactly indicative of a quote unquote drunk slut, since they feature a pretty well put together looking Jessica Davis dancing nicely with her boyfriend at the school dance, so it's clearly a scraped barrel here, but still it gets to her. Season 2 follows Jess's trials in navigating a hostile school environment with the reputation and isolation that Hannah felt. During this time, she is led to a rape survivors group where she meets a character called Nina. Nina is interesting, mainly due to her inclusion being as left field as Scott Reed, a man we will glance over at, and just as underdeveloped. See, Nina behaves as an interesting catalyst for Jess's own recovery, highlighting the problems inherent in refusing yourself the time to get over your trauma, and this happens in ways that make sense and ways that don't, but bottom line, Nina is there to be a rape victim who isn't recovering from her rape in a way that the show considers to be correct. See, Jess is speaking to Nina and Nina's boyfriend when Jess references how she and Nina met at a rape survivors group, but Nina stops her before she can spill the beans, quote unquote, and later tells Jess that she's over what happened to her and she doesn't want her boyfriend to know what happened to her and doesn't want what happened to her to define her. The show kind of frames it in a negative light that Nina doesn't want to tell her boyfriend about the fact that she was raped, and I feel like we are supposed to agree with Jess that being honest with your partner is a healthy thing, and broadly it is, yes, but I mean it's not Jess's place to tell Nina's boyfriend, nor is it Jess's place to be annoyed at Nina for not telling her boyfriend. I think it's completely valid for Nina to want to move on in whichever way she feels comfortable, and it is completely within her right to not want to tell future partners what happened if she honestly just feels like she would rather not. Like, she's not broken goods, she doesn't need to come with a warning or a condition, and you know, maybe she's also just not told him yet. Just because she's not told her boyfriend immediately doesn't mean it won't come out further down the road. Maybe she wants to be sure that she can trust him, considering we've seen the way that rumours can spread in the school. Maybe she doesn't feel that comfortable with him yet, maybe she's dealing with her own internal shame first, and once she's got her ducks in a row, maybe she'll sit him down. Either way, Jess isn't entitled to demand that Nina processes her trauma in a permitted way. Eventually Nina comes back to Jess and she's like, hey, I really heard you, so I decided to come clean and tell my boyfriend about the fact that I was raped. And Jess gives her this nod and this like proud smile and she's all like, see, I told you it would be for the best if you just did that and just didn't sit with me very well. 
Nina and Jess's friendship dies at this point on account of their differences of opinion. The irony of Nina having no control over how her story is told comes in at the end of the season. We find out that she is the one who stole the Polaroids that were going to be used as evidence against Bryce, and she burns them. Like, she destroys all evidence. And it's implied that she did this because some of the girls in the photos were smiling and happy, and a cynical defence lawyer could argue that they were therefore not assaulted, only worsening the pain and humiliation of these girls when such photos made it into public circulation via which Whichever means. However, other Polaroids featured straight up photographed evidence of the rape of many unconscious young women. Nina removes the only physical evidence of this mass of victims' assault, which is an extremely difficult thing to obtain in a sexual assault case. Like, events often happen in private between two people, and reports are often made much later, long after physical evidence is gone. Having a photograph of a rape taken by somebody who was an accomplice to that rape is significant evidence. The irony of wanting to control her own story whilst taking control from the hands of other victims is potent and very frustrating to watch. And for the record, I don't actually think that this is bad writing. I don't actually critique the show for this. I think this is actually pretty good writing because it makes you dislike the character for the choices that they have organically made. She was just on silly billy hours, you know. Despite this blip, I felt like Jess's story was the strongest side story and the most reliable. Her road to recovery is shaky and she's thankfully propped up by a solid support system, especially Alex, who bunks off from school with her when she needs a break and tries to protect her from some of the nastier actors. Her story culminates in her finally making her own testimony, which comes at the time that the Bakers lose their case against the school, a bitter but expected ending. It begins with a segment featuring all the female characters sharing stories of assault, harassment and rape, in various circumstances and to various ends, focusing on consequences such as professional backlash. I found the scene a little bit too on the nose for my tastes, but probably because I'm pretty familiar with many of these instances and didn't see any as especially surprising. So, I mean, if this worked for you, gave you some clarity, made you look differently on a situation that's never quite sat right with you, then all the power to you. It just didn't really work for me. Bryce is arrested and in the final episode we see a very short segment where Jessica's court case takes place. It's a flimsy one, being that it's his word against hers, and Bryce again gets off scot-free with a mere slap on the wrist from a judge who very squarely both sides the debate, but the frustration felt at watching this was clearly intentional. Seeing not one, but two court cases that were crucial to the direction of the season both fall flat on their faces, worked counterintuitively to the good guys always win, not once, but twice. But in a way that made cruel sense, you know, either through witnesses lying on the stand, the selfish destruction of evidence to save face, schoolyard politics, or a judge who really does not give one single solitary shit. 13 reasons why season 2's biggest win was in how effectively it demonstrated the cold reality of the justice system. No matter how much evidence you bring, no matter how many witnesses you have, no matter how much the writing is on the wall, sometimes it just doesn't work your way. And yeah, light was pretty effectively shed here, so hats off. So first and foremost, before we get into the Courtney Crimson discussion, a few people pointed out in the comments of the last video that I tend to give men a lot of grace for things that I would crucify women for, specifically when comparing Zach Dempsey and Courtney Crimson. I was like, oh, Zach made a mistake but I was like, oh, Courtney Crimson is a horrible person. At first I really struggled to take that feedback on board, but on reflection I actually think it was pretty valid, more in the sense that rather than falsely crucifying women, I tend to just over-excuse male behaviour because I underestimate their emotional intelligence and I give them gold stars for exhibiting the most basic human decency. Thank you for those of you who pointed that out, my internalised misogyny is pretty ingrained from my upbringing, not a story for now or probably ever, and as the term internalised implies, I don't always recognise it. You know, feel free to point out my problematic shit. I can't promise it won't happen, but I promise that I will try very hard and I will try to learn from it as well. Anyway, let's get on with the section. Courtney in this series, as with other characters, receives small tweaks to her character to carry her forwards from last season, which was a welcome change. In season one, Courtney is so scared of her secret coming out that even after Hannah's death, she was resolutely pinning all of the blame on Hannah, like coldly announcing Hannah's fault, Hannah's lies, being entirely spiteful in her retrospective pinning of said blame to prevent people from finding out that she, Courtney, is a lesbian. On reflection, I think the 
the issue with this plotline was that beyond getting a little bit of harassment from Monty de la Cruz at the dance, a man who harasses everybody, we don't have a world presented to us where Courtney is going to receive intense homophobic bullying for coming out. Yeah, this school is a harsh place and there's definitely tons of bullying, but we don't see the stakes for Courtney, being that we really see instances of homophobia at the school. So it's hard to get behind her when she's being that rude and that cruel to people. Like, don't get me wrong, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. I can believe that it exists, but we aren't shown that and therefore Courtney's actions have no stakes and she just comes off as really horrible. I can understand that Courtney wants to avoid being bullied, but her characterization is so unnecessarily cold in season one. This cold indignance carries all the way through to the end of season one, and unlike many of her male counterparts in the cast, Alex, Zach, Ryan, for example, Courtney shows absolutely zero inclination of acknowledging and growing past what she did to Hannah. However, at the start of season two, Courtney has turned an immediately quick leaf, and her writing has adopted a far more compassionate tone. And that's all there really is to it, actually. Like, Courtney walks into the season as a character I began to really root for. She has a few moments, she gives her testimony, and then she vanishes from the spoken script almost entirely. Like, she's present here on out in a few scenes, often without any lines. She she just kind of gives like a sad look to whoever's speaking. She's more just physically present so that we don't forget about her, but she is all but forgotten in season two, just as her character begins to show promise, which is great. I don't have much spectacular to say about the Bakers, but I wanted to give them a little shout out here. By the time this season begins, a month after the last season ends, Mr. and Mrs. Baker have already separated because Mr. Baker has moved in with somebody else. I know, right, he's clearly making efficient use of his time. We find out that he's actually been cheating on Mrs. Baker with some other woman since Hannah was alive, and specifically in the flashbacks, it's long hair Hannah as well, so quite a long time. I didn't give this particular plot point much credence, I guess they were just backdating the affair so that the one month turnaround wouldn't seem so extreme. I have no idea why they didn't just have this happen during the court case and during season two itself, I suppose, but whatever. However, one of the things I liked about this couple, or lack thereof, I suppose, was the show's dedication to portraying a relationship breakdown that felt fairly organic. The two of them still care about each other, but the marriage has disintegrated. Even towards the end of the season, when they embrace over Hannah's grave, they acknowledge that they had a good run before just kind of moving on from one another. There's not much to say on this one, but I appreciated the fairly honest feeling trail. Marcus gets a significant amount of fleshing out in this season. Not all of it feels earned, especially the episode that he narrates himself where he shares how hard it is to be him and how difficult it is for him to be at school when we've just had the pleasure of watching him actively make that school a worse place. Marcus's themes seem to slot fairly squarely on the effects of peer pressure, the need to fit in, wanting to be liked, and to be close to people with good social and political influence, even on a high school level. His dad being a politician gives us a macrocosm to Marcus's microcosm and his dad's advice is generally just look out for yourself and be selfish, which Marcus does to fairly devastating ends by lying on the stand and sabotaging the court case. According to his fan wiki page, he's one of the only main characters to have zero appearances in seasons three and four, so this is his last series, and in his credit he does go out with a bang after lying for Bryce on the stand, claiming that Hannah and Bryce were in a relationship, which accidentally gets Bryce sucked into the trial even more. Marcus takes some time to reflect on what he's done before announcing that Bryce is a rapist during during a speech he gives towards the end of the season. I mean, we lost the case, Marcus, but it's the thought that counts, I suppose. Ryan gets about as much characterization in this season as he did in the last, serving this time to vocalize Hannah's continued interest in Justin, reveal that there were more poems where Hannah explicitly said that she wanted to die, so the lawyer can ask him, why didn't you do anything, Ryan, and then Ryan points us towards the clubhouse. Ryan's retcon is probably the most frustrating one, being that Hannah all of a sudden was writing poems very explicitly saying that she was struggling to find a reason to carry on living. Like one of the poems said, you can't see what's going on because what's going on is too deep and too dark for you to see. Everyone's smiling and talking and happy. And I'm thinking, how the fuck are you so happy when I'm screaming inside? I want to leave, but I can't. I'm bound by the will I can never give up. Why am I stopping? I want to leave, but I can't. I'm bound by the will I can never give up. You do what you have to to try and survive. I may be ugly, but at least I'm alive. Now, in season one, the poem that Hannah wrote that was passed around the class was used to 
all but say that she was thinking about killing herself. And it's like, all of a sudden, they have now invented a second poem where she just kind of says it. And I hate that. Having Ryan characterised last season as a clever but self-absorbed individual who used Hannah for his own ends, but felt deep regret for her death and tried to make amends for it, was an interesting angle for the show to take. His clear guilt combined with his renewed dedication to begin coming clean, setting things right and working forward more positively, combined with his snarky reminders that Bryce is a rapist whenever anybody stuttered in their loyalty, worked pretty well. I liked him a lot. In season one. In season two, he's characterised in retrospect really weirdly because he's characterised as being far closer to Hannah, he cares about her far more in retrospect, he knows all of her secrets, watched her spend tons of time with Justin, which we'll cover later, worked on loads of poems with her, and read several passages where she explicitly says that she wishes she was dead and is barely holding on. And I found it, I found this contrivance in particular quite insulting, it, it peeved me. I feel that he is not particularly present and not especially well utilized. Sorry, Ryan. Chloe is one of the new characters in the show, introduced at the beginning of season two when Jessica Davis makes her return to school. Jessica goes straight back to the cheerleading squad only to discover a new member of the team waiting to meet her, Chloe. Chloe is super nice to Jessica only to reveal after practice that she is Bryce's new girlfriend, instantly driving a pretty significant wedge between the two girls. Chloe's storyline is a tragic one. Soon after getting together with Bryce, she discovers his true nature when he forces himself on her multiple times. There is a lot of rape in this season, actually, and I can't tell how I feel about it. Now, not to sound like a barbarian, but one thing that I felt was especially effective about Chloe being repeatedly raped and abused on screen was the way it became routine, dull, and underwhelming. The overuse of casual insult coincided with the way that Chloe would have experienced it. Like, the first time it happens, she's not really sure whether or not she wants it, but then she's like, okay, yeah, sure. But on the other end of that, Bryce was also pushing her very hard you know, whereas like a, a normal boyfriend would have backed off. And then the second time it happens, she very explicitly says no quite a few times and then just lies there and waits for it to be done. Like if you get raped straight out, it's tragic, traumatic, intense. If you're in a relationship with somebody who slowly ramps up their control until you have no idea what you're even allowed to be upset at, there's a pretty reasonable way of demonstrating that kind of building control if when you have limited time per episode to demonstrate it. Like on one hand, we have the absolute absolute soul destroyer that Hannah endured in season one, and we even have it replayed for us in season two, thanks very much 13 Reasons Why, but on the other hand we have the soul chipper that Chloe undergoes, where Bryce helps himself to her over and over again until she eventually just stops resisting, losing herself one grain at a time, so slowly that she doesn't even realise what's happening to her, and I think it's effective, if not difficult to watch. We see Chloe sitting alone in a lot of the latter scenes, staring off into space all tired and miserable, not able to focus on anything, and while some of that is going to be due to her inner turmoil over reporting Bryce, much of it is going to be down to coming to terms with what is happening to her every day and not feeling like she can escape it. When the tapes are released and the whole school, including Chloe, hears them, she takes the time to scribble out graffiti written about Jessica Davis in the bathroom, showing that she understands Jessica's precise position. When Chloe is presented with a Polaroid depicting Bryce having sex with her unconscious body, photographic evidence of a cruel rape, Chloe agrees to testify on behalf of the Bakers. But when she goes to tell the court that Bryce is a rapist and an abuser, she has a change of countenance on the stand when having to deliver said testimony while staring him directly in the face. I know this was an absurdly frustrating scene to watch, and definitely an angry scene to watch, but I felt like Bryce's abuse and control over Chloe was comprehensively introduced, maintained, and justified Chloe's hesitance to testify against him. Also, I was more frustrated that none of the kids made copies of the Polaroids since they all got lost a minute later. Shortly before her time on the stand, Chloe begins to try and distance herself from Bryce, and if you've ever been in a relationship with someone quite controlling, and even if not, you might recognise her behaviour here. It's like she's trying to get some mental space, you know, she wants to step out of the forest, see the big picture, without Bryce muddying the water and confusing her. One of the aspects of their relationship is the way Chloe constantly takes steps back over the line she's drawn in the sand. She will put a boundary on the table, and then she will stand behind 
behind it. Bryce will walk over to her, figuratively of course, and he will push her back over the sand and then he steps over it himself. You know, this is a deliberate controlled set of behaviours that he uses to remove her bodily autonomy and override her consent one slow step at a time that results in her spending a lot of time in a confused daze, unable to understand in her own mind whether or not she is actually even justified to tell him to leave her alone. And so, towards the latter end of Chloe's arc, she backs off and tries to get a handle on herself so she can figure out what she wants to do next. Shortly after Chloe decides to testify against Bryce with a Polaroid photograph of him raping her unconscious body in the clubhouse, he finds her at lunch and very sweetly talks about how he's going to take her on a nice holiday somewhere beautiful. And you can see her kind of soften a little bit, become more conflicted, you know. It's almost as if she's saying like, maybe I am just being difficult, you know, anyone in that situation would think like, maybe he is nice, he's very generous, you know, maybe this is gonna be me falsely accusing him, I don't want to ruin this man's life. Later, when she goes onto the stand to testify, she is suddenly faced with him. Like, she has to look right into his eyes and testify to his face that he raped her in front of his parents, many of her friends at school, and many strangers, and she bottles it. Now, there's a bit of an issue with this scene that originates mostly in the source material. This is a TV show, and this moment specifically is the big twist. You know, we've been ramping up to the idea that Chloe is going to testify against Bryce, she is going to be our winning card, and then, you know, it drops heavily, she's no longer going to testify, she's changed her mind, this is supposed to be a frustrating shock. You know, we've been betrayed at the last moment by a woman who cannot overcome her manipulator. But the way she is directed to say it in the scene, you know, the way that the actress is told to deliver this line, comes off like a smug announcement of a villain who has finally overcome the hero. This isn't the regurgitated line of someone who has had her consent stripped away from her, been raped into submission, ployed with promises of wealth and experiences she herself would never be able to have, and then forced to tell her fuzzy, disoriented truth in a room full of strangers, schoolmates, the parents of her abuser, and her abuser himself. So I found this really, really shit. Chloe is framed with less pity in this season than Tyler Down, and we will discuss him later, but spoilers, he doesn't deserve it as much as she does. And that's certainly on the fault of the show, who have her pivot so bluntly at the last second that they make her come off like a conniving accomplice to a rapist who will never see justice, rather than continue her characterization of the abuse victim. This was kind of disgusting, I hated this. The more I think about it, the more I actually really hate it. I think it's easy to see Chloe as materialistic here, and maybe materialism does fall into it in some capacity. You know, she's able to be ployed by shiny things and manipulated for the future aspirations of being a stay-at-home mum with two summer homes. And it is easy to see her as evil, but it's specifically because the TV show sacrifices her humanity in order to deliver a twist at the end of a side plot that started to imply that Bryce might see some justice if she could just bring herself to testify. I do really think that with some different on-screen direction, Chloe could have come out of this season and still possessed the deserving empathy of the audience. Instead she came out of it looking like some kind of rape pick-me, which is bad news beers. I didn't appreciate this at all. Sorry, I just got a knock at the door. My Moxie the Band stuff's here! Yes! Fucking love those guys. If you guys ever see this video, I love you. And I'm sorry that this had to happen when I was discussing Bryce being a rapist. Okay, let's start again. If you've seen my previous video on 13 Reasons Why, you will know already in depth my opinion on the choice of Bryce being that season's big bad. And to offer a condensed version, I hated the cop-out of using an evil villain character to strike the final blow and offer a perspective on rape that I found unhelpful and two-dimensional. Yeah, rape can happen in the way that Bryce raped Hannah, but in the majority of cases, that is not how it happens. And if you're gonna start a conversation, you might want to be a little bit more helpful about it, is all I'm saying. And you, the viewer of this and 13 Reasons Why, may be either entirely irritated or entirely in agreement to learn that I actually thought Bryce's characterization worked much more in this season. My only grievance was that it was needed last season, rather than wedged in after the fact now to like, plug the plot holes. You know, I guess they can't help it, but yeah, that's kind of just how it goes. 
In season two of 13 Reasons Why, alongside all the other retcons and Hannah was lying moments and but that wasn't on the tapes moments that drove me nuts, we learned through a series of flashbacks and randomly plucked memories that Bryce and Hannah spent more time together than was told to us in season one. We learned that Bryce and Hannah actually spoke conversationally quite a few times, but during Bryce's testimony, he tells us that he and Hannah took a drive together and sat staring out at a bridge. In his testimony, Bryce even recounts that Hannah said some unusual things about jumping off the bridge, to which he had replied that she was weird. He then claims that they had sex in his car quite a few times throughout their time together. You know, super casual announcements to make during a court case, right? But as we learn, the opposite was true. Bryce said the weird shit, Bryce came on to her, Hannah rejected him, and Bryce was left staring out into the sea or river. Upset that he had been rejected by a girl, it's implied he had his own grotty little romantic feelings for. There are a few scenes following where we see Bryce and Hannah have some uncomfortable encounters, such as in the clubhouse, but she is firm in her rejections and she clearly controls the situation she's in. If I was to have been in her shoes, I think I would have assumed that he was a well-intentioned guy who had a bit of a crush, but maybe he'd get over it. You know, a couple red flags, but nothing serious, and until he did get over it, all it would take was some clear and honest rejections. Naturally, as we go on, we find out that she overestimated his respect for said rejections. Now hear me out, and I know that these scenes weren't in the book, so my hands are somewhat tied here, but these scenes would have been so much more productive in the first season. Again, rather than introducing Bryce as like the Darth Vader of rapists who takes what he wants, regardless of whether or not it is offered to him, Bryce becomes a bitter, spoilt brat, and he cannot compute that Hannah does not reciprocate his grotty little feelings. Bryce is retrospectively characterised as a shitty child who has always been given everything he wants and cannot come to terms with being told no. It makes Hannah's rape at the end of season one with this context 1000 times more tragic and simultaneously relatable. I know from the comments on my previous video that many, many people have been too scared to hurt feelings or too scared of backlash to be crystal clear assertive when rejecting people who are sniffing around for that kind of weakness. That person you hang out with who gives you a weird feeling and something tells you that if you tell them no, it's gonna be like a massive conflict. Like, that's Bryce, at least that's Bryce in season two. And all he needed in season one was that glimmer of characterization. Sure, you know, it's a bit contrived as to why Hannah was hanging out with him in the first place, but it's the same level of contrived as it was for all the other characters to suddenly have these rich unspoken histories with her that weren't mentioned until now. But for better or worse, they're in the story now, and this is one of the better instances of the show fleshing out one of Hannah's relationships more sufficiently. It's a retroactive improvement, which has to count for something, like season one still handled it really badly, season two patched the leak, but there's still a leak, you know? Also I love that whenever he's in court he wears like these nerdy little glasses to give the impression that he is studious and innocent, like it is high school rapist 101 behaviour. I thought that was a good touch. So I've mentioned a school shooter fake out a few times throughout the course of the video and this is why. Tyler Down is the first character we receive a first person narration from this season, which accidentally positions him as the main character in the first episode. Yeah, I honestly did think Tyler was going to be the main character of season two, when in actuality it's because his narration is just his testimony on the stand and Tyler's testimony just so happens to be first. Now Tyler's arc is an interesting one. Firstly, like many of the male characters from season one, Tyler is revealed to actually have been very close to Hannah in the beginning. In fact, she seems really close and comfortable with him, more than she is with Clay. The first piece of evidence used to discredit that Hannah was unhappy is in fact photos from a shoot Tyler took Hannah to where he photographed her outside. In the present, Tyler's arc is about how socially awkward bullied kids become school shooters? Yeah, it was teased at the end of season one and reached, shall we say, fruition in season two. The show fakes it out a little bit at first. Tyler makes friends with some Billy Joel kid called Cyrus and the two of them go around shooting guns and spray painting stuff, talking about anarchy and destroying the system. Tyler sees Cyrus as someone who's going to help him bring in some kind of new world order, destroy the system from the inside, get justice, but Cyrus in reality is just a kid who likes rock music and the vibe, which is fine by me, no judgement. Cyrus is actually a lovely character, he's a lovely boy. So Tyler is bitterly disappointed by his friend's reluctance to quote unquote teach this school a lesson, and after a few fake outs where the show makes us think that Alex might be 
the shooter because playing shooty game make him frown and twitch funny, and Clay might be the shooter because he enthusiastically wants to help teach the school a lesson, Tyler becomes our shooter. Get comfortable because we're about to get really uncomfortable. The circumstances of me seeing the scene I'm about to discuss were darkly funny. We cut to Tyler in a bathroom and bored of Tyler scenes and bursting for a piss, I was like, boys, I need a wee, I'll be back in a minute, just tell me what I miss, and returned to the most traumatised, outraged group of men I've ever heard chorus together in a Discord call. Obviously comments on the last video mentioned that this was going to happen, but it's been like six months and long enough, both since the video went live and since the start of watching season two, that I had long since forgotten that it was going to happen. So I had to rewind the show by a minute and watch it for myself while my friends minimised the screen and waited for me to tell them it was all clear. After everything that happens, the court cases, the rapes, the drugs, the content, Tyler gets brutally raped at the climax of the season. Halfway through the final episode, 30 minutes left, he is standing in a bathroom when Monty De La Cruz walks in, pins his head against the toilet and shoves a mop handle up his backside. When he pulls it out, it is covered in blood and as we see from a later scene, Tyler is bleeding so heavily from the back end that if this wasn't in the States, I would probably suggest you go to hospital. It's a horrible scene to watch and definitely a choice that I don't agree with. While I found the rape scenes of last season to be tragically impactful and Chloe's rape scenes to be like miserably normal, this was like not the way. Destructively, sexually abusive, needlessly cruel. I guess it's up to you how you decide to show a turning point in someone's life and attitude, but I would not have done this and I can barely put into words how I feel about it. This is just not the way. Tyler returns to school shortly thereafter with a gun and a bag full of ammunition and this is like the last five minutes of the entire season. An event most Americans will now know at least second hand about is boiled down to a cliffhanger ending of a show intended to shed light on difficult topics in the most exploitative possible way. Even as an English person watching, I was disgusted with the way this show slapped an attempted school shooting at the end of the season for the sake of being able to drop it in the content warning, like another badge of honour on a scout sleeve. I absolutely hated the writers at this moment. I can't imagine what possessed anyone to think this was a remotely sensitive or productive idea. Also, the rabbit hole that Tyler falls down, leading up until this moment, is quite vague and it paints him as a tragic, misunderstood figure who is just like lost to the whims of Gunny before anyone can help him. Tyler goes to shoot up a school because he's getting bullied, a phenomenon that's been foreshadowed since the beginning of season one and Tyler's gun collection has been growing since about then too. In season two, we see him truly want to change the world for the better and dismantle the system that keeps rapists floating at the top away from judgment. And you know, his methods aren't exactly clean, but I think we can all agree that that's fine as far as motivations go. Anyway, he enacts this mainly through vigilante justice, like he paint bombs Marcus after he lies on the stand, he burns the word rapists into the school field at night, you know, he's a rowdy little hoodlum. However, Tyler becomes upset that his friend Cyrus doesn't actually want to commit to the bit, you know, go whole hog, start really pushing their movement into the public eye, and although Tyler is clearly being a bit of a shithead, he's not hurting anyone, so it's hard to see these initial actions as actively physically dangerous. Rather, the behaviour of a man with a noble cause who wants to avenge his dead friend as much as Clay does. It's the mop rape that ends up pushing Tyler over the edge, but I mean, that's not the reason he goes to shoot up a school. He's been collecting guns for this moment for like almost two years, so it's hard to pin the attempted shooting on this one specific moment as disgusting as it is. You know, when else did he plan to use the guns he was buying and for which cause? He could have just gone and shot Monty if he wanted him dead and puzzled as to why he went to mow down hundreds of innocent teenagers when he has spent the whole season fighting for Hannah's voice to be heard. Needless killing in the name of Hannah's needless death doesn't really pan out. Season 2 was spent watching Tyler fall down a rabbit hole, a pipeline perhaps, but one that lacked the, shall we say, political backing that these people often fall into, and instead he ends up more of a tragic figure than Chloe, who was abused into silence when testifying on oath. Like, how do you write a school shooter that badly? Luckily, I suppose Tyler doesn't actually shoot anyone. Clay greets him at the door, a move I am pretty sure is extremely ill-advised, and meets this man only to get a gun held in his face. In a move woefully main character, this show certainly starts a conversation, if that conversation just so happens to be headed with how to die first than a school shooting. It takes like three minutes to talk Tyler down, then he gets in a car with Tony who speeds him away as the police approach, leaving Clay standing there with Tyler's gun in his hand. And I thought Game of Thrones had a bad ending.
In season 1, Clay had the benefit of being one of the only people who was nice to Hannah. He was one of the only people she was herself with, he worked with her so they had plenty of one-on-one -on -one time together, and he had a romantic connection with her that seemed pure, albeit romanticised on his end. I found myself straddling the opinion that the story took Hannah's experience and fed it through Clay, distilling it into something that was no longer her story. Sure, yes, Clay has an infatuation with a girl after her death and he carries her hurt with him, but by the same merit we hear Hannah directly through the tapes. Some Something I think served as a way to make sure her voice was still heard and this wasn't like Clay's thing. Yeah he did make it about himself quite a lot and yeah he wasn't quite in the position to be entitled to shoulder her post-mortem problems but a lot of his behaviour was also a projection of his own guilt so you know I to and fro in it. Hannah and Clay's lingering connection is what drives him to step out for her. Unfortunately season 2's insistence on fleshing out every relationship Hannah ever had results in diluting her relationship with Clay in hindsight. Yeah Clay and Hannah had a crush on each other but Hannah now has had a heavy romantic connection with Justin Foley and a romantic and sexual connection with Zach Dempsey and they talk way more than she ever did with Clay. Yeah, Clay was one of Hannah's only friends but now we find out that she had long-standing and consistent loving friendships with Tony Padilla, Alex Standall, Tyler Down and again Justin Foley. Now, Clay isn't really in a position to be Hannah's knight in shining armour. What place does he have in her life to announce that he loved her when Hannah and Zach clearly had a much more lingering, permanent set of feelings for one another. What place does Clay have to insist that he was the only one looking out for her when he actually barely spent time with her compared to other members of the cast? As season 2 fleshes out the other characters and their bonds with Hannah, retrofitting hours, days and weeks worth of quality time spent with people she had far more of a relationship with, no matter the ups and downs, Clay begins to shrink away from the forefront. As time goes on, he begins to seem like a bit of an obsessive, possessive incel, going absolutely ballistic and contemplating giving up on believing Hannah altogether when he finds out that she she had sex with Zack during a summer when he was at camp? Oh dear Clay. Yet the show doesn't pivot from Clay's central spot. Dylan Minnette is a sick actor obviously and he carries the leading role pretty effortlessly and I guess maybe they wanted to get their Minnettes with but Clay drags the narrative down as the worst outcome for his character manifests. He does take Hannah's tragedy and makes it his own. We do see a story about a girl told through the mouth of a man who actually has no real respect for her as a human but rather as a manic pixie dream girl I idol placed on the earth to help him be happy. Rather than a well-intentioned wallflower stepping out of the shade to make sure his dead friend's memory is heard, Clay becomes an angry little creep, hijacking the memory of a girl who meant half as much to him as she meant to the people who are now revealed to know her better. And that's a difficult character assassination to have to deal with. Because while Clay does see less screen time in this season, he is still arguably the main character. He is still the catalyst for so many of the events that take place during the season. He drives the final push for last minute evidence and testimonies and he is there giving the pep talks and fighting for what Hannah would have wanted when in reality the show demonstrates that he never really had any idea who she was, only who he wanted her to be. Tragically and ironically, Hannah Baker ended up being the character taking the shortest straw this season. Since every other character in this show seemed to apparently need extra layers of backstory and characterization to make them more interesting to the audience, which is debatable, and Hannah herself apparently needed more backstory reveals and rewrites, she ended up leaving this season with an utterly butchered story. It was sorely disappointing. Watching this season with my friends, there were moments where we would laugh and roll our eyes because suddenly Hannah's best friend with Tyler, suddenly Hannah's in a relationship with Zach Dempsey, suddenly Hannah's hanging out with Bryce Walker, suddenly Hannah's sharing thousands of texts with Justin Foley, but there would be moments of sheer genuine disgust when her backstory had been written explicitly to frame her as a liar for the sake of drama. I know that there are two sides to every story, I know that Hannah is going to have written her tapes from her perspective, focusing on the events that she saw as relevant, and she clearly would have omitted certain things or seen other things through her perspective, skewing the way it's read, but anyone reading a personal record knows this. Season 1 did a good job of showing us that Hannah wasn't always on the money, such as with Zach Dempsey keeping the letter she had written to him while she thought he'd thrown it away. While this wasn't especially helpful in some places, this drama fed to us more as a way to raise stakes than shed light on real world issues, it was nothing compared to the way Season 2 cannibalised her story. All of a sudden, all of Hannah's memories of her friends and enemies are either 
wrong, exaggerated or greatly edited. She and Courtney, turns out, kissed more than once. She and Bryce spent a lot of personal time together, including in the clubhouse. She and Alex were really good friends. She and Tyler were really good friends. She and Tony were really good friends. Her mum is shown to be nastier in retrospect as well, suddenly giving us a reason as to why Hannah didn't go to her for help when things went bad. Hannah's support system grows retroactively and we are now shown an image of a woman who had a lot of people who cared a lot about her. We are shown a suicide note that is retroactively no longer her words but is now an abundance of, in retrospect, often spiteful lies. I think a few omissions here and there would be natural, you know, she's not going to remember everything, she's not going to include everything. A few secrets can be expected to come to light in a court case, but adding all these details for the sake of fleshing out the surviving characters ended up weighing so heavily on Hannah Baker's character that she was unrecognisable by the end of it. After posting my last video, loads of people were so happy to discuss 13 Reasons Why from their varying perspectives, and most of the discussion was really productive. But I also had tons and tons of comments remarking on how, well, Hannah's a woman and women lie, and Hannah's a bitch who made it all up for attention, and Hannah's exaggerating because she's a hysterical bitch that killed herself so that people would like her. Like. A lot of comments. I screenshot a bunch of them and they did end up in my Discord server, uh, but a lot of them I just deleted because the misogyny that bled so hard into their judgement of Hannah Baker that they were just all out incel ranting about women was like way too depressing to watch. Some of the comments could reasonably have been assessments of the show, albeit limited in their capacity to empathise, and others were just blind hate and abuse towards a fictional woman and other women by extension. Hundreds and hundreds of comments that spanned between the fairly reasonable, well I wouldn't believe everything a teenage girl says, which is fair and it's demonstrated in season one that she got a few details wrong, to the outright hateful, that stupid bitch deserved to die, she's a liar who wanted attention, all women are liars who want attention, and it was some of the most disappointing troves of human discussion I've ever seen, it was really sad to watch that manifest in the comment section. And as I was watching season two begin to pick apart and unravel all of Hannah's stories to demonstrate her as a liar, I just remember sitting there with my head in my hands. All of these horrible comments about Hannah flitting through my mind, knowing that this season would do nothing, would do nothing but vindicate the people who hold the attitude that teenage girls are lying attention seekers and prove their assumptions right. Yes, Hannah is a fictional character who took her own life because she honestly couldn't see a way out of the misery she was enduring, or at least the misery she was enduring in season one story. It was really Really, 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 really disappointing to see the writers of this season sacrifice Hannah's integrity and paint her as a massive liar when she was explicitly written in the first place to raise suicide and bullying awareness was just... it's hard to put into words how annoying it was. I, my head was in my hands. I was like, what was the point of doing this? 13 Reasons Why is a show written with the explicit intention of shedding a light on difficult topics. It depicts itself to us as an educational tool written to help young people understand how bullying and abuse looks, which factors can tip a person onto a track to suicide, and demonstrates that everyone needs empathy no matter what they do. Yeah, 13 Reasons Why Season 2 did a good job of demonstrating that not everything goes your way. He said, she said court cases don't work out in the she said favour when you have a sexist judge in the chair, even when Carrie Characters like Justin Foley are willing to be witnesses and corroborate stories. Holding large institutions accountable when they have a crack lawyer and a team of witnesses willing to lie on the stand to keep their records clean means that the good people don't win. The people who work from within to improve circumstances get fired. It did a good job at that, I'll give them that. But to find this resolution, I can't emphasise how hard they needed to stamp on the bodies of dead teenagers to write this story, how much they needed to take the name of a girl they spent a season telling the story of and drag her through the mud. How they needed to turn her only friend into a bitter, possessive incel. How much they needed to pull and prod at a story, adding baubles and notes and decorations to it until it was unrecognisable. And we looked back on a first season that by all rights was almost entirely ignored by the second with the goal of cultivating drama. I spent the first half of this season finding it boring and redundant. I spent the latter half of this season with my head in my hands. Shed a light on this 
this dick in your mouth. 13 reasons why. Thank you for watching. Many of you in the comments section warned me about this series and I have to say I thought you were exaggerating. This was egregious shit. Miserable, horrible shit. It made me want to write a letter. I was so upset with it. If you enjoyed the video, drop me a follow here on YouTube. My social links are listed in the description below and subscribe to my Patreon for five minute reviews every Tuesday with the occasional bonus review on some Saturdays. And a special thanks to Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brendan Sidereal, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocha, Fosh, HM, Julia, Carissa Fulcher, Sam Jones, and Liquid Pliskin for being my highest tier patrons. Thank you guys so much, I appreciate you loads, see you in the next one.